بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ تعالی وبرکاتہ میں دی پیس اینڈ بلیسنگز اف اللہ المائٹی اینڈ ہز بلوور رسول صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم شاور اپن اول اور وات ویورز اینڈ لسنرز واچنگ دس پوڈکاسٹ سیریز محمد دی ہیومنٹیرین مائی نیم از ادنان سہیل اینڈ آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ فور ٹوڈیز پوڈکاسٹ سیریز برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز اینڈ اور ویورز اینڈ لسنرز واچنگ اینڈ لسنگ ٹو دس پوڈکاسٹ سیریز اراؤنڈ دی ورلڈ You are watching this special Rabiul Awal transmission brought to you by Minhaj Welfare Foundation. Minhaj Welfare Foundation has been serving humanity since 1989. Alhamdulillah, this Rabiul Awal, we're not just celebrating the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, we're also acting upon his prophetic, prophetic traditions and we're also giving in his, uh, according to his prophetic tradition of sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of the best ways of acting and giving upon uh, the blessed month of rabiul awal is understanding his traditions and understanding his prophetic values this is something that we hold uh, very close to our hearts uh, being followers and being the ummah of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as part of minhaj welfare foundations Uh, Milad with Minhaj campaign, we have launched a Maulid relief package. This is a way for us to give during the month of Rabbil Awal and follow the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The details are on the screen. If you wish to donate, please donate uh, via website minhajwelfare.org or um, visit our uh, various uh, community centers around the world for where you can make a donation and a contribution. Inshallah, tomorrow there will be a live telethon at 5 p.m. London time, inshallah. My dear brothers and sisters, uh, today is the final podcast series, and I don't think we could have had a much um, um, unique individual that we could have invited uh, as to the guest that I'm about to introduce. Dr. Hanil Banna uh, is a very... Um, famous name, not just in the Islamic world, but also in the humanitarian sector. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Dr. Hanil Banna uh, was born in Egypt. Uh, and I've just found out that we also share a common um, traditional learning. Uh, I myself uh, studied in Jamit al-Azhar, and I've heard that Dr. Hanil Banna also studied in, in um, Jamit al-Azhar. So there is some sort of commonality that we have um, there, alhamdulillah. Um, Dr. Hanil Banna, um, he studied uh, medicine both in Egypt and in the UK. Um, he resides in, the, in Birmingham. Um, he's the president of the uh, Humanitarian Forum, the chairman of the Muslim Charities Forum, and um, the founder of Islamic Relief, uh, Islamic Relief Worldwide, is a very famous uh, Islamic NGO, which I'm sure all our viewers and listeners are aware. Uh, we are very fortunate that Dr. Hanil Banna uh, joins us. Um, uh, I know uh, he's been traveling extensively to Sudan, and I'm sure uh, throughout the program we'll, uh, we'll hear on his uh, journey to Sudan and his findings uh, in that region of the world. Dr. Hani, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother Adnan. Dr. Hani, thank you so much. It's, it's an honor for us, and, and, and I am... Uh, privileged, uh, uh, kind of, um, um, uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really short of words uh, because uh, I've, I've always wanted to share this platform with yourself and have the opportunity to speak uh, to yourself and learn from yourself. And I'm sure uh, today our listeners and our viewers um, on Minhaj Welfare Foundation and our various uh, platforms, uh, we can learn a lot from you, inshallah, today. Um, Dr. Hani, I, I know um, that um, podcast and, and, and you're regularly doing um, uh, these uh, interviews on, on a regular basis, but the, the past 10 days we've been focusing on the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, really looking at the humanitarian perspective of the sublime character of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, hence so. our uh, podcast series is titled Muhammad the Humanitarian. Um, today, um, we invite you, uh, based upon your 30 years or so uh, legacy and, and your activity 
within the humanitarian sector. And I don't think there was anybody more worthwhile of this title that we could have invited, uh, especially when we discuss the humanitarian perspective uh, of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this kind of brings us uh, very um, um, smoothly into to our discussion uh, today, uh, because here is somebody who's traveled all the way from Egypt, uh, you left um, that uh, long civilization, that beautiful country where people love Ful and Tamiya, uh, in addition to many other things. And sure. then you uh, came to the UK in, in Birmingham. Uh, what kind of things motivated you and inspired you to get involved in the uh, Muslim charity sector, in the NGO sector? And what, what inspired you to, to found, find um, Islamic relief? Uh, Alhamdulillah, Wassalam wa Rasulullah. First of all, thank you very much for asking me to be with you today. I'm very honored to be with you on your platforms. And my best regards for our Sheikh, inshallah, Mu'anna uh, Qadri, and everybody watching us tonight. To be very honest, the beginning was extremely simple. Extremely simple. No planning, no strategy, no budget, no big figures behind the start up of this organization or of my inter introduction to the humanitarian and social work. It happened like that after the famine in Africa in 1983, when we found hundreds of thousands of people coming from Eritrea and Tigray crossing to Sudan, and we discovered that we don't have any platform for the Muslim community in UK or in Europe to represent Muslims and to start to respond to this kind of uh, problem. This is how we started. No office, no budget, no big names, no businessmen, no political leadership, no even sheikhs and others. And we started as young medical students in 1984, actually in a space or in a place in Birmingham where actually we use only the address to receive uh, the letters or the communication with other community. It was only two people, two young people, myself, I was doing my doctor of medicine in Birmingham University, and my colleague, Dr. Hassan, was doing his doctor of medicine in chemistry in the same university, and we used to walk, walk from road to road, from street to street, from shop to shop, from mosque to mosque, actually to try to raise as much fund as we can for Africa at that time. And we managed to succeed. Alhamdulillah, it took us about nearly now, 30, uh, nearly 37 years next January, inshallah. But before that, to be very honest, the sparkle of light which uh, uh, ignited my feeling toward finding how to help. It happened in 1982 when I visited Bosnia for the first time. It was, at that time, it was called Yugoslavia. And I landed in Sarajevo to find a lot of Muslims there and nobody speaking about them and no human rights talking about them. And they were actually all of them were actually behind bars at the time of the communist socialist regime of Yugoslavia at that time. So we started to help, 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 help from Africa to Bosnia to many other countries. I, I wanted to sort of understand, um, obviously this was your, uh, your passion and, and, and from what you're saying, um, there was no um, attachments to the reason why you set up this. And I think it kind of moves very um, effectively to, to the course of our discussion, which is Muhammad the humanitarian. Um, and, and most of the guests that we've invited, we've kind of uh, tried to create our discussion based upon the, the teachings and the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, and, and, and for our viewers and, and for our listeners who are Muslim, non-Muslims, from, from the life of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, what can we find? And I remember a, a very famous narration um, in which, and, and you talked about the famine crisis in Africa. I remember there is an example in, in Syria where there was a famine in a place called Mudr, in, in, in uh, what now is known in Arabia. And, and the Prophet وسلم, sent out a convoy uh, to help those people uh, with the famine. So so what can we learn from the Prophet's life as, as an example 
in terms of having this obligatory nature to help others? Well, Alhamdulillah, uh, Prof. Muhammad, the word humanitarian in Arabic is absolutely different in the meaning to the word of humanitarian in English. Uh, in English, it means responding to calamity, to disaster, to affected population, to others. But in Arabic, is to look at the humanitarian aspect of life of every being, not only every human being, of every being. So, al-insaniya, بلغة العربية معناها the insaniya or the humanitarian work in Arabic means that's all inclusive. And this was the difference between us and the committee, International Committee of Red Cross in the 90s last century at the beginning of this century about how to try to marry both definitions together. In Arabic, it's all inclusive, which uh, the Prophet was looking at it, that you look at the climate, you look at the animals, you look at the birds, you look at the water, you look at the habitat, you look at the human beings, you look at the human rights, all, 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 all. This is the Arabic context of insania or humanitarian. Nowadays, the English or the European context of humanitarian is humanitarian response only when there's a disaster. So Prophet Muhammad because he was a community leader, social worker, and visionary, he was all inclusive of actually looking at this component you find in his life. He was looking, was caring for birds, for animals, for trees, for water, for climate, for individuals, for everything. And that's why Muhammad was well, Prophet Muhammad was described in his character that he is the man not only of the century. But he's the man who came to save humanity for all the different aspects of humanity, whether it's actually the habitat, as we understand it, or the, uh, the, uh, the animals, or the everything he was talking about. Even he was a teacher, and the husband, and, uh, and uh, a father, and the grandfather, and all these sorts of aspects of life in his character, which was extremely important. I was trying to... Uh, uh, talk about the humanitarian character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the multiplicity of the multiple dimension of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you give me one second, I wrote it specially for your discussion uh, today. There's not, okay. nine, so there, there are, in my own view, there are nine dimensions in the character or the personality of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. MashaAllah. One of them is the internal dimension. The internal dimension, which has four principles, dimensions. Searching for the ultimate truth, contemplation and reflection on the great creation of Allah, self-worship and purification, forethought on people's affairs. This is number one dimension of the internal. The second dimension is the circumferential dimension, social dimension. It's about how to deal with family, how to deal with relatives, how to deal with friends, how to deal with community, how to deal with tribes, through his manner, through his behavior, through his credibility and integrity, and through the transaction and dealing with the public. This is the second dimension, the circumferential, which is the social dimension. The third dimension, which is diagonal dimension, and forward-looking, and the visionary dimension of the Prophet Wasallam, dealing with public, with political, with social, with religious, with theological, with economical, with historical, traditional leadership on the local ground, regional ground, and global ground. This is the third dimension of the Prophet ﷺ character or the personality. The fourth dimension of the Prophet ﷺ character and personality is the unseen dimension, al-ghayb, ilm al-ghayb. The unseen dimension was the unexplained phenomena could happen to support his mission, and he's expecting it. Because he is connecting himself to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fifth dimension, which is the vertical dimension, where he always finds himself in direct contact and proximity of the ultimate source. Source of what? Source of knowledge, source of power, source of guidance, source of wisdom, and source of self-satisfaction. And this is actually the fifth dimension. The sixth dimension of the personality of the Prophet ﷺ is lower dimension and underlying dimension where he can deal with the forgotten creation, as I mentioned earlier on, other creation of God in the society. 
The seventh dimension, which is the cross-cutting dimension, is dealing with the risk-taking. Prophet ﷺ was dealing with the risk-taking, risk-taking measures, as well as the action taken to protect the different component of his society. Number eighth dimension is trans-dimensional and trans, and trans uh, transformative dimension, dealing with the creation of pioneering, innovative, creative, sustainable solutions for what? For different societies that actually, and different problems. The last dimension with the holistic, philosophical, and the cultural dimension of the cult of the Prophet ﷺ is dealing with culture of the process of the climate, of the social and change in the society. These are the nine dimensions of the personality of the Prophet ﷺ, and we can add more and more and more to understand the complexity of the individual who Allah has sent him, Rahmat al who Allah has sent him to save humanity, who Allah has sent him to be a guidance for everybody, not only for Muslims, but for Muslims and Muslims, for animals, for birds, for everything. This is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, actually, that we are talking about him. Well, mashallah. You know, this is quite a, a unique uh, aspect in terms of in which you've gone through the, the various uh, aspects of his Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life as, um, as you termed it, as in Arabic, Al-Insaniya. Al-Insaniya. Uh, there's a couple of aspects which you, you've touched upon. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to look in the, the concept of self-satisfaction um, uh, this is a, a kind of a unique uh, aspect uh, that you you look on, on, on in, you focus in your description in terms of the multi-dimension aspect of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. I, salam. Salam. I just wanted you to just to uh, further elaborate on this um, what aspect of self-satisfaction do you mean uh, in terms of the relationship of an individual uh, with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, uh, are we saying that um, through following the Prophet والسلام, one becomes closer to Allah Almighty by performing X, Y, Z action? I, I think um, um, I, I would really like to, to really understand this concept. Oh, Self-satisfaction could come from three elements. You're following the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, in action, not Rehearsing the of the Prophet ﷺ. This is number one. Number two is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in public and in private. Especially we are when we are in our uh, rooms at night and trying to pray and uh, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in secrecy or in private life. The third and the most important dimension of this self-satisfaction when you mix with the people that Allah want and the Prophet ﷺ wants you to mix with and to help them and to guide them and to save them and teach them. This is the most satisfactory dimension of the three because the foundation is following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, communicating with Allah SWT, but on the practical ground is being with the orphans that you're talking about, with being there was the displaced, was being with the elderly, was being with the sick, was being with all those components of any society. And this does not stop you from helping the non-Muslims who needs your help. The help does not stop at the level of just the neighborhood or the level of the family level, but it goes beyond the religion, it goes beyond the culture, it goes beyond the, your value. People in need, give them the hand. Satisfaction comes to you from whom? Not from the queen. Not from the king, not from the president, not from the job. The salaries that you take or the title you take. Satisfaction comes to me as an individual from a smile being drawn out of the heart of the young boy or a girl who has a sticky eyes, have no shoes in, her, in his or her foot, with a very, uh, uh, very dirty cloth, running nose and stretching his hand or her hand to you think telling you thank you because he sees in you a dream a hope aspiration and solution and he runs to you and this is the most satisfaction when we will be earning the the ultimate blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when such a young girl 
or a young boy will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allah, Allah, don't let him to be thrown into hellfire. He one day did help me or she one day did help me. And this is the real satisfaction. And let me take you to Pakistan. I was coming from Afghanistan in 1998, I think, or 1997. Of course, by road from uh, Kabul, uh, Muzaffarabad, no, Kabul, Kharan, and, 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 until we, we reached Muzaffarabad. On the highway, there's no highway in, in this area, but on the main road, a young, an old man was standing on the road and waving to us. We stopped the car. We thought that the man wants a help, wants some money. And my colleague, his name is Adnan, like yourself, he came out and was trying to give him 500 rubles. The man was, was dumb and uh, uh, deaf at the same time. Said, oh! He did not want the money. We thought that the man wanted a lift. He came to the car with us. When he came to the car, he was the, 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 the strongest smell of the sweat knocked me down. I could not be able to take it as a humanitarian worker because I was weak. Did not mix enough with this quality of people who teach us. You know, when I look back, when I look back at the car, when I actually look at it, I saw a smile I have never seen in my life up till now. The smile of thank you. And this is satisfaction. The satisfaction from somebody who never met you, have no relationship with you, and have no blood relationship with you, and no business with you, but he say, thank you from where? From the heart, from the mind, and from the soul. This is a satisfaction that we need to look for. How do you, from, from, the, from the satisfaction, and, and, and you kind of elaborated, thank you so much for that, Zon. Uh, from the satisfaction, we have the transformation of when one gives uh, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of sadqa. Now, sadqa itself is a very unique word. Um, and as, as you are Ahlul Lugha, uh, sadqa comes from the word tasdiq, um, uh, verification. And, and there's a very uh, beautiful um, uh, explanation. In, I think this is uh, reported in uh, Ibn Rajab's Jam al Ulum in, in his hadith book that he says that uh, the, the Prophet والسلام, said that uh, when one gives charity, uh, it, is, it is a proof or, or intent of, a, of an individual. I just wanted to understand from your understanding, um, when one gives charity, how does it transform the life of that individual to the one uh, when he's giving it to the rightful owner? I want to understand that transform transformation basically. Uh, transformation, if we, if we build on this kind of satisfaction, uh, satisfaction leads to motivation. Motivation needs to an innovation, and innovation needs to find sustainable solution for the community. When you are satisfied in the field, Brother Adnan, all your dreams come to the back of your mind to be fighting to come out as a project, as an idea, as an initiative. What do those people need? They need very basic stuff, very simple. Clean water supply, dwelling, as the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ بَاتَ آمِنًا فِي سَرْبِهِ مُعَافًا فِي بَدَنِي إِنْ دَاءُ قُوتَ يَوْمِي كَانَ كَأَنَّمَا حَيْزَتْ لَوْ الدَّنِيَا Those individuals who live in safety in any dwelling have got the food ration for the night and they are healthy. They are like the dunya is favoring them to anybody else. This is what they need from us. They don't need cars. They don't need a telephone. They not, don't need anything. They need actually to be respected. Respected. This kind of transformation, you transform the dream that you have after the satisfaction and the motivation into action-oriented project to help those people, whether it's in the water uh, project, whether it's agriculture, livelihood, whether it's actually education, whether it's health project, Anything was was a building market for the people, and 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 so from the smile, brother Adnan, into the dream, into the motivation, into the action, and this is where sadaqa come in the middle. Sadaqa come in the middle, and let me give you one of the best sadaqa I have ever seen and taken in the whole of my life, because sadaqa is not only 
amount of money which could be a million dollar or five hundred thousand or ten thousand, whatever it is. I was in Brooklyn, Mosque in 1994, 1995, going around and round and round during Ramadan, making uh, uh, jaldi, jaldi, jant, uh, what they call, as they call it in, in Urdu, uh, janda, janda. Uh, uh, and I was talking about him. Huh? Janda. Janda, janda. Okay. I was talking about Hazrat Ali's uh, uh, saying about the, the vehicles in heaven. And one of the Afro-American uh, revert to Islam came back to me after I finished. You know what he gave me, Brother Adnan, and every listener listening to us today, or every viewer see, watching us today, he had the, the, the food carbon, which is given to him by the government to feed wow. his family. He tell me, sir, I only have this carbon, which is about $3. Can you accept it as sadaqa, as donation? Of course, I accepted it, and they kissed his hand, and they kissed his hand. Because this is what he has. What he have? You know what the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ said? The best of sadaqah, khayru sadaqah, juhd al-muqil ila faqirin fisad. The best of sadaqah is the effort of the, the those needy people to the people who need it most. Three dollars as a donation from somebody who is going to buy with it or to take with it his food ration for the family. And this is the sadaqah that I cannot forget from this Afro-American young man in this area. And this is the blessing which comes to you at the very beginning of your mission, actually, in, in actually humanitarian and social work and development work. Those kind of acceptance from those, from those people will be cementing your mission for a long way to go. Alhamdulillah. Um, and mashallah, it's, it's, it's always pleasing to, to hear Dr. Hani and then the different perspective, especially on the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And, and, and there is no greater framework uh, and, and paradigm that we can look in uh, than looking at the sunnah and the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And that kind of moves to, to the next uh, topic. Um, and I know, Dr. Hani, uh, your efforts, and I was just reading uh, some, uh, some information about yourself, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've traveled to almost 68 countries and 360 all sorts of cities uh, around the world. Um, alhamdulillah, that this is all this all the, uh, all the figures. It's it's all figures. So okay, I'm sure you can um, yeah. uh, uh, sort of tell us the new figures. Yeah. But I, I just wanted to understand again because I know uh, your current role uh, within the humanitarian forum and and, and the work that you're doing um, uh, bilaterally or multilaterally with other agencies and, and with other governments, you, you have a very global approach in terms of um, this humanitarian approach, whether it's on the Islamic context or whether it's the uh, Red Cross context or whether it's the United Nations context. I, I wanted to understand what is the, what is the prophetic context of, of, of reaching out to the global village that we are living in. As the Prophet ﷺ said that, uh, al umma jasadun. The, the 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 umma is like a body, and if one uh, aspect of the body feels so some so sort of pain, the entire body feels that pain. So, what is the framework that the Prophet alayhi salam laid down in terms of having a global approach, uh, whether it comes in the form of uh, a humanitarian response or uh, whether it comes in the form of our topic today, a humanitarian response? His love to save to serve. To guide. They feed out of their love the miskin, the orphan, and the prisoner of war. His love. You know what? Once upon a time, a Jewish man or died. And he stood up to his funeral in respect. The companion told him, he's a Jew. He said, it's a soul. The most respected Creation of God is the soul of man, whether he is Muslims or non-Muslims. This is number one. To respect the dead, regardless of his... So he was trying to help those people, to save them. That's why he himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was actually caring for this dead uh, Jewish individual at that time. Actually, uh, this is his love. Keep loving to save people. To save people, to save people. And if somebody 
died in any part of the world. He wanted himself to be there to help, to spread his hand. When there's no uh, no money and no, and no no nothing in his hand at that time, especially at the Meccan time. At the Meccan time, you remember actually when when new Muslims used to come to 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 to, to the Prophet Sallallahu having no proper dressing, no, no food, nothing, 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 used to cry for them, used to cry for them. This is the character. Humanitarian work in, 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 uh, at the background of the mind of the Prophet ﷺ is a mission. Is a mission. Is a mission. It's not only a mission. It is a value-driven mission. It's a lifelong mission with a deliverable message and actual tangible product that you deliver. Humanitarian, social, development, work is not a lip service. It's not just delivering goods. No, the people would love to see you next to them when they want you to be with them. The people would love to see you when you don't leave them alone, when it becomes risky for you and your organization. And the people who pay our salary, Brother Adnan, are those miserable people in Syria and Yemen and uh, uh, Myanmar and uh, Rohingya and Uyghur and, 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 and everywhere in Africa, in Chad, in Nigeria, in Central African Republic, in Democratic Republic of Congo, and all those people, those people, Prophet Sallallahu taught us to respect them as much as we respect ourselves and others because they are the provider of our sustainable existence actually in the livelihood. From their money, we have their salary. From their money, we pay for our electricity and we pay for our bills and we pay for the education of our children, for our cars or even for our holidays. And we can put our foot in their shoes when we find that actually we have a house with mortgage, we have a car with mortgage, we have, we have, we have, and those people who pay our salary are living in tent, and sometimes, as I was in Sudan, six or seven or eight families are living in one room. Men, women, and children. And this is, he wants from us to change our work into a mission, into a deliverable message, and the tangible product to serve the community. Because Islam is about what to deliver to help, what to deliver to save, what to deliver to guide, not what to deliver to speak about. You, you, you mentioned that um, one in terms of a, a tangible uh, product, uh, in terms of uh, giving one perspective of uh, a global approach and and the Prophet Sallallahu's love for humanity. Um, I, I wanted to sort of understand also the, the importance of creating ties uh, geopolitically, uh, one nation with another nation, and how through a global approach, um, through humanitarian intervention from the life of the Prophet we can build closer ties with uh, communities, irrespective of their race, their color, or their creed. What's your intake on to that? There are formulas, which is networking, connection, communication, and partnership. We cannot work without this. No way. Networking, connection, networking, uh, connection, network, communication, and partnership. I call it, in one of the proverbs in the good old days, connection is protection. The more you connect with people in the good old in, in the good days, in the very good days, the more that the people will protect you in the bad days. And this happened to Islamic Leaf when I was there in 2001. I tell you about connection and the, uh, uh, building the bridges. We started to open our doors in 1991-92 before Bosnia War. To go to attend UN meetings, to go to try to apply for uh, uh, European Union, which we call it this actually, uh, uh, I can't remember the, the organization now, uh, and to be a part of this big club, 
even we registered Islamic Relief in 1993 in the ECOSAC, Economic and Social uh, Status, having Economic and Social Status, in 1993, nearly 27 years ago, to go to learn, connect, communicate, and build partnership, and to understand the mechanics and the philosophy of thinking and the, uh, uh, and, and the values of the United Nations and other organizations. And from there, when 2001 unfortunate uh, uh, incident happened in America, people already knew us 10 years beforehand. So when it came, actually, the, the, the axe did not cut our throat as an organization, especially in America, because people were talking about us in private meetings, whether in London or in Paris or in New York or in Los Angeles or in Washington, D.C., in any part of the world. So be ready to connect, to connect, communicate, and build partnership. And building partnership does not happen overnight. Overnight. It takes years because building partnership means, Brother, Brother Adnan, that you need to earn the trust of the other partner. The other partner could be a government, the other partner could be a donor, the other partner could be another organization like yourself, the other partner could be anything. Partnership has to take a, a time, it might take five years for till, till people start to trust you and respect you. And this is extremely important and essential to connect, to connect, to communicate, network and build the partnership. People will protect you and do Hello? 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 Dr. Honey, um, can you hear me, Dr. Honey? Yes, I can. We were talking about connection, and you, you cut off for one minute, I think. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Connection is protection. Okay. Go, go ahead, go ahead. We're connected now. Okay, uh, so uh, to answer your question, connection, networking, uh, building partnership, and communication are the main principle of sustainability of any organization nowadays. Uh, in the view of what's happening, of Islamophobia, maybe money laundering, maybe the banking industry are trying to make a problem for all the Muslim charities and others, and all this kind of counter-extremism, counter-radicalism, and the prevent and non-prevent, and all this sort of thing. Let many people to know what you are. When you are having a good time, there's no problem. Don't wait till some problem happened to you and start to communicate with people. Building partnership does not happen overnight. It takes years, years, years for people to trust you, to respect you, then to build partnership with you. It doesn't happen overnight. That's why it have a strategy to build this kind of, of, of partnership. Because, as I told you, in 1993, we registered Islamic Relief in the ECOSAC United Nations because we had a dream and vision in the 80s to go to be a part of this uh, organization and to manage to succeed, to be there in a, in, 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 in a time when we did not have any recommendation from any government to sponsor us at that time. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing the, the kind of transformation. Um, obviously, we take all of this inspiration from the life and, and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad. That's what's Allah, Allah, that's what's Allah. Allah. Um, and I just wanted to um, here just focus on, on one particular aspect um, when we are talking about the rightful owners of whether it's charity, zakat, Sadaka and I and I know uh, we have many charities whether they are, they're of the faith Muslim faith or the non-Muslim faith we have many billboards uh, advertisements and I think speaking to you right now I think I will probably take advantage of getting your uh, input in this as well and, and I would just take an example of um, sponsoring orphans uh, it's, it's it's a massive campaign it's a massive project for for organizations uh, around the world, but uh, we we still see and, and we hear 
of, of a hadith of the Prophet والسلام, in which the Prophet والسلام, says that uh, the best house in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes is the house in which an orphan child is looked after. And, and we hear uh, numerous ahadiths. In terms of orphan children, or you can even add to this as well, if it's whatever project it is, what, what are the kind of um, framework that we can learn from the life of the Prophet والسلام, that we can instill in our framework in terms of working with the rightful owners, and in this case, orphan and needy children? Okay. Uh, Prophet Hassan was orphans. That's right. He was looked after by his own family. I am anti making uh, orphanage. I'm against making orphanage. Whether for girls or for boys, whether people like it or not. Out. Khalas. This number one. Number, that's why the Prophet has been uh, uh, raised in his uh, uncle's house. His uncles, his relatives, and the extended family, and he was there to actually develop his young Carter as a young, uh, a young, young man at that time. This is number one. Number two, we are, no, we are making no justice for the orphans' expenditure on him or her. Let me be very frank with you, brother Adnan, and for your viewers. Orphan uh, sponsorship became like a competition business competition who should get the orphan before the others the orphan sponsorship could be 29 27 28 and this this organization make it 29 this organization make it 28 this is wrong 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 if we go back to how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described uh, lady uh, mary maryam alayhi salam a word in Arabic called wa kafalaha zakariya. Yani zakariya made kafala, sponsoring it. You know, I was in a conference in, in Istanbul and it was uh, uh, orphan care organization conference. And Sheikh Ali Quradaghi was there. And they said minimum, minimum cost of an orphan sponsorship is above $100, not $30. Pounds. No, no, Sheikh Ali Quradaghi, uh, another Sheikh. Okay. okay. Okay, and the sheikh came and was very angry. I don't like to fight with sheikhs in public because they can actually <laughs> terminate your, your, your career, okay? He said, Allah said, kafalaha means he was treating her like his son and his daughter. This is the word of kafala or sponsorship. There's a big difference between support and kafala. Support you can give from one dollar or one rupee or one ruble. But kafala, you have to treat the orphan as your child. And this is actually the Arabic and the Islamic context of it. So really, what my message to the organization who are actually competing for just giving uh, some amount of money to the orphans, just for the sake of having extra uh, 500 or 200 or 300 of, there's no orphan. Let me take you to a journey. Come with me to any African country and say 30 pounds. No way. Come to me to any Asian country for the full, full sponsorship. No way. Even if you convert it to the local currency. And we have to be very honest with us. And the donor have to understand that. If you want to go to heaven, you spend. If you want to go to heaven, the the the, uh, the, the, the good of Allah, the good of Allah is heaven, and you have to spend money to go to heaven. And if it's not cheap, you have to spend the money. And we need, as organization, to stand up together and decide how much the widow needs to sustain her life, how much each orphan needs to sustain his or her life, and how much the displaced or different needs, because those people are human beings like me and you. They want to have at least, at least basic life in their countries. And what we give them of money, to be very honest, Brother Adnan, is not enough whatsoever. And this, and this is my statement to everyone. This is my statement. We, we, we appreciate uh, your, your, 
your uh, insight into that, and I thought it was uh, good to take your time now and uh, an advantage of you being here and, and give it some sort of framework. Again, we're talking about the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you quoted some very beautiful sources and ahadith of the Prophet alayhi wasallam. I wanted to come to uh, some modern day um, and some very pertinent uh, issues. Um, uh, the, the refugee crisis um, has, I think, in the past uh, five to ten years, uh, shook the entire globe um, because one, especially for those living in the West, we've seen uh, the refugee crisis hitting our own homes. Um, I don't think Islamically or there was a term of refugees. Uh, the only concept that we can uh, understand was the migration uh, from the uh, Muhajir from Mecca to Mukarama to to Medina to Manabra when the Ansar had had, had welcomed them. Uh, th there's a couple of questions here, and I think I'll just probably break it down basically. First of all, what is um, the, the what was the Prophet Sallallahu response when it comes to the uh, refugee crisis? And then then second to that, what is the uh, what is the duty of those refugees that come to a home that isn't their home, what is their responsibility? And I, here I wanted to focus on, on the latest issues that we've seen, uh, be it on uh, Islamophobia, uh, be it on uh, certain terrorist attacks that have been attached to individuals that apparently were refugees. So, so I, I just wanted to see uh, what's your viewpoint on, on these two points. One, on the general theme of the refugee crisis, and the second, um, something which is kind of hard hitting on, on, on media right now, the, the roles and responsibilities of the refugees who are away from their homes, living in a country that has, in a way, opened their doors for them. Okay, if we can start with the second point, okay. we have to treat the refugee as a credible, integral individual. Some of them are more qualified than the humanitarian worker. We saw that in different countries, we started with Bosnia, professors, doctors, teachers, and others. We can use the, these human resources to be with us, actually, and this is what we call it a participatory approach. When we involve the refugees, whether in the camp or outside the camp or a community center, to help us as well. Because in certain area, most of those refugees have profession before they started to travel from A to B to C to D. This one thing. Second thing, the humanitarian response uh, as money. We should look at how to spend it. In my own view, I'm advocating strongly of spending not less than 70% of the fund on humanitarian response. You got it? Yeah. At the time of crisis. What to do with the second 30%? 30% should be spent at the time of crisis on the community to build the local capacity on the civil society organization in the community affected by the war and the others. So we should not, this is my own view, and I will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, very confident in my social fatwa. Sheikh Qadri can give religious fatwa, but I can give social fatwa. My social fatwa will be based on community building. Once the, the, the crisis is over, the media is out, there's no money coming to you. That's why I want to take the 30% from the very beginning to build a community while you are giving the hand out. What's happening so now to this? You officially opened the Darul Ifta of the social sector. Okay. Social, uh, you should have both fatwa. Social could be guided by the... the the, the religious or the uh, mufti or theological mufti and social because we are the people on the ground. If you get any sheikh, even the grand sheikh of Egypt, and ask him about this kind of things, he will not understand it unless you either explain to him or take him to the field to see by his own eyes. So you are the actual the practitioner. So for at the time of the crisis, at the time of refugees, you have to save this 30% to spend it on on another kind of humanitarian response, but to develop the local community at that time. This is regarding the refugees and others. Regarding the, the response of the Prophet ﷺ to the new Muslims who came, the poor ones, 
At that time, the community or the society was one layer. It was not complicated. A small mosque in Medina and a few hundred maybe houses and maybe a thousand or two thousand or three thousand people. Go to the mosque, the people stay in the mosque actually and he call upon uh, uh, make azan or uh, uh, kabir. People come to start to help those people inside the mosque. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ in, 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 at that time used to respond to those people who come with no clothes, no money, no food, and work, walking, walking for days and nights to come to the central authority in Medina at that time. Nowadays, you cannot do it this way. And that's why at the time of Hazrat Umar, radiallahu anhu, Hazrat Umar start to structure the state, the modern state of Islam, by making Dawaween, by making this departmental finance and other and Baytul Mal and others to try to classify the needy and others to have the help from. And now the, the, the issue is extremely complicated. We have one of the things which I appeal to you as Minhaj and to everyone is we need to train and mentor as many as young people as yourself and younger to become future leaders. Actually, if we die, somebody like myself, before doing that, I will be sinful. I'll be sinner. We have to create the system, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. Let us train them, because training is not only about the tools of how to make the project, it's also the morality as well. I just wanted to get your views on, uh, I know it's a very um, hard-hitting topic, um, and I know you have mentioned a lot because it's um, it's actually kind of um, strong on social media right now, the, the, the recent uh, attacks in, in France, um, and the uh, government's response to that attack, and then the, the stabbing of two hijabi Muslim women in, in Paris, um, and then this global boycott, uh, we've got certain state actors uh, responding to that as well. Um, what is the humanitarian response to an incident like the ones that we saw in France? What we have seen in France uh, is not a freedom of speech. Because freedom of speech should be to everyone. Okay, that's number one. This freedom, this lack of freedom of speech to one side will let young, hot-headed individuals to behave like what you have seen. And for whether they're actually from this religious background or this religious background. And for any community leaders, if he or she looks at a multi-dimensional community, okay, he or she has to look at the interest of every individual of the community. Not to sideline himself with the majority or herself with the majority against the minority. Because the act of extremism or radicalism or terrorism could come from anyone. Once he sees there's no justice. Or once she sees that there's no justice. And here we need to ask political leadership social leadership, humanitarian leadership, to be neutral in this kind of things. Not to uh, throw yourself at the deep end of political discussion. And we need to advise our leaders of to doing the same. We are not going actually to use a community as a propaganda machine for my election campaign whether it's in this country or this country or this country or this country. Because I am a credible citizen. I am a citizen which is uh, very loyal to my country. My country is France or Britain or Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, any country. I pay my tax. You respect me. Whether I am uh, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Jewish, Christian, whatever. Don't, don't look at my color. Don't look at my race. Don't look at my language. Don't look at my cultural background. Don't look at my religion. Sufi, Sunni, and others. I am, I am a citizen. I am a citizen. I am equal. 
And the citizen in each country, Brother Adnan, is the, the ultimate authority in the country. But without citizens in any country, you don't have country. You don't have nation. You don't have government. So really, as I mentioned earlier on, that the one who is having the upper hand and pay our salary is the poor people and the orphan. The one who really having the upper hand in any country is the citizen. And every, every uh, responsible individual in a government should act as a servant to the citizens. And this is what, and this is the dimension of teaching of the Prophet Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hani, for oh. your uh, wise words and, and, and sharing um, this platform today on, on Muhammad the Humanitarian. This is brought to you by Minhaj Welfare Foundation. Finally, Dr. Hani, um, we, we ask all of our guests um, to, to let us, uh, our listeners and views and all, about the work that they are currently doing. I know you just come from Sudan. Uh, I know, alhamdulillah, uh, age isn't a, a factor when it comes to yourself. You're still 21 in terms of you moving no, around. No, 19, 19. 19, <laughs> alhamdulillah. Um, so, so what, what kind of things are you doing? What's your, what's your um, 2021 looking like? Um, and, and also, uh, um, some words of inspiration to our listeners and, and viewers out there, inshallah. Uh, I was there for a week in Sudan, learning a lot from the displaced people, from the women and from the young children and from the elderly, learning a lot from the local community, actually organizations here and there, and going around to try to do to help them. I don't have as much as fund as I used to have in the good old days. But what I'm, I'm promoting at the moment, climate change. All what's happening in Sudan, 1988, then uh, last year, 2019, then this year, it's climate change. It's carbon dioxide emission. It's the production of carbon dioxide. It's the increase in temperature of the globe. It is the rise of the sea level. It is a flooding. It was in Ethiopia after Sudan. Last week, it was in Ethiopia as well. It's happening. It was in Niger. It was in East Africa, it was in Pakistan, it was in Somalia and others. It's climate change. And here we need to tell our young people to start advocate for stop, stop, stop polluting the, the climate of us. This is number one. Number two, be, 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 invest in two things. Invest in waqf, waqf, waqf to give sustainability and invest in research, research, research. Nothing will be, will be changing if we don't have a, a, a research-based project. These three things, climate change is, is now become, become like an emergency. Every now and then you find a flooding here or a fire here or whatever it is. What is this? And you know two countries on the globe producing 45% of the carbon dioxide, 29% from China, and 16% from the of America. And both of them are not in the climate change conference, unfortunately. And both of them are members of the Security Council. You got my message? So I've got your message. And, and, this, and this is what I call the advocacy. And this is what I call the advocacy, where most of our organization don't believe in advocacy. And, and, and I think those uh, wise words, again, on behalf of Minhaj Welfare Foundation, on behalf of the founder, um, Sayyidi Sheikh Islam, uh, Dr. Muhammad Tahir Qadri, and behalf of the entire Minhaj family, thank you so much, Dr. Hani al Banna, for your precious time uh, and, 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 and for your words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and, and give you a long and healthy oh. life. I mean, so I mean. Uh, viewers and listeners, you are listening and watching this podcast series, Muhammad the Humanitarian, brought to you by Minhaj Welfare Foundation. Do visit our website, minhajwelfare.org. And remember, this is a month of celebration. It's a month of action and it's a month of giving. Uh, Dr. Hani knows this a lot better. Uh, but in Egypt, I remember on the 11th and 12th uh, day of Rabi al there would be a ihtifal uh, of the Mawlid the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tomorrow, we're also celebrating online the Mawlid of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
This is going to be a global Maulid celebration. Um, we're going to have uh, Anashids from uh, Indonesia, from Lebanon, from Kenya, where we can sit at home and listen to the prayers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Join us tomorrow on Bin Hajj Welfare Foundation at 5 p.m. Uh, from your host, Adran Sohail, and our guest, Dr. Hani Al-Banna, OBE, Chairman of the uh, Muslim Charities Forum and the President of the Humanitarian Forum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.